back to your posting to the special duty squadron. Yes. Because that's uh, an expression that you don't hear very often. Mm. Uh, special duties meant uh, something different than yes. normal bombing from yes. Halifax and the rest. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, special duties were very hush hush, and you weren't supposed to tell anybody about them. So the no war's over. You can tell us. Yeah. Well, I know, but, but but nobody would tell us. I mean, they just told us you're going on special duties. We had no idea what it was until we got there. And it consisted of uh, flying Halifaxes without a mid-upper turret, but with a trap door in, in the bottom of the fuselage. And there was a, like a runway running down the middle of the, the fuselage to that trap door where you could push packages out from inside. And all the bomb bays were set up for containers, which we dropped all the bomb racks, and uh, we dropped all kinds of stuff. We dropped spies and saboteurs, we dropped bicycles and money, pigeons, leaflets, uh, ammo, uh, guns, all kinds of stuff. Anything that they needed over there, we used to supply them with it. And it was a matter of uh, you were on your own. There was no no uh, bomber stream or anything like that. You were on your own. You did your own navigate your own navigator. Uh, we talked it over. We knew where we were going, and we'd plot our course to avoid any obstacles that we didn't want to see or hear or see or, or get shot at with. And uh, when we got to the, the drop zone. Uh, we had a dispatcher in the, in the inside, and he would open the hatches, uh, the, the, what the hell do you call it, the floor, and get it already there, and then we'd fly up into wind onto the area where the reception was, and they had it all set up for you so you knew which way the wind was, and just dropped your stuff from about 400 to 600 feet if it was uh, material, and 600 to 800 feet if you had people on board. Was this mostly at night or day? All night. All night. Um, and preferably moonlight, but we did operate at times in the dark. Uh, we went to Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, France, and there were a couple of cells in Germany too, but I never got involved with those, but there were a couple of cells in, in Germany where we dropped. And on our squadron, we also had Lysanders, and they used to go over and land, and sometimes take people over too, and bring people back. And Hudson's, they were on 161 squadron, and they used to go over and land, and bring people back and other stuff back. Uh, also, they had a flight of Halifax is doing the same job that we were doing. Well, if Hudson's and Halifax's were going to be landing over there, there had to be a, a reasonable uh, level field for them to, to use. Oh, yeah, yeah. A couple of them got hung up over there and uh, had to stay over. They used to cover them all up with uh, boughs of trees or something like that and, and push them away so they could haul them out get a lot of people out of the village or somewhere to pull them out of the mud, if they were in the mud. The underground would be in touch with people in England then, advising what was needed and yes. when and where to drop it? Yes, yes, they had a, they were all coded, all the dropping zones were coded and you dropped it wherever you had to. Sometimes uh, uh, the Germans were waiting there and sometimes the Germans were running some of the Operation areas. We had one chap drop two two uh, spies one night, and he dropped right in. They dropped right into the German hands, and uh, somebody went back. And about two nights later, they dropped another two, and they got the same fate. So somebody was tipping them off. 
Yeah, sure. uh, on those flights, uh, what about the crew and the aircraft? Would it be a different arrangement of crew than, say, on a typical bombing raid? Only the same number of crew. We had uh, four Canadian RCAF and three English RAF. And uh, the bomb aimer, who was a Canadian, was a map reader primarily. Really read the map and used to have to get positions and everything for the navigator. The navigator was a Canadian, very good on the G, and uh, he used to take us in there. My fl the uh, wireless op was an Englishman. I was the pilot, Canadian, and tail gunner was a pilot, and the dispatcher was putting the stuff out the uh, hatch was English. The G, in case someone was watching this, was a navigation instrument. Right. Uh, and uh, it was fairly accurate. It was pretty good, but we were pretty low. So it, it, we, we didn't get it. So, but you often got a good jump on it. Sometimes you'd pick it up where you least expect it. He'd find it. It was weird. Yeah. And uh, we went in very low, went across the channel right down on the deck to keep below the uh, radar and cross the, into the land area where we were going. And then perhaps we would climb up a bit so we could map read because it's difficult to map read when you're too close to the ground. And uh, it was very good to have a good map reader and have places to read because then you knew not to fly over certain areas where you knew that they were waiting for you with black or something. And uh, when you got to the drop zone, you just prayed that they'd be there. And most of the time they were there. They were pretty good. Sometimes when you got, a, one time I got to a drop zone, they were having a, their own battle with somebody down below. You could see the tracer going back and forth and they were fighting. So I didn't drop because I didn't know who was who. And uh, went into Holland once, uh, and they had so many drop zones that you knew darn right well with all those lights flashing, the Germans certainly knew <laughs> that something was going on. So I didn't drop that night either. I pulled out and went back out. And uh, Was there much of a, a loss of aircraft? Uh, about, the, about the same as Bomber Command. About the same as about Bomber the same, Around 3%. We lost four, I think, the night, not D-Day, but uh, the night after D-Day, I think we lost four one night. Was this primarily because you were flying at a lower altitude? Well, yes, some people ran into problems like that, but uh, primarily I think it was uh, not paying enough attention to where you were. You know, you have to, have to have your mind set on everything that was going on or you could run into a lot of trouble, right? Yeah. And as I always say, I tried to fly a little too low for heavy flak and a little too high for light flak in the middle. So you didn't get in too much trouble. I did 40 trips there. I did D-Day. D-Day, uh, our crew was, was part of the force that went up into the Pas de Calais as a decoy. We dropped window, which is a metal foil, strips going across the channel uh, to jam the German radar so they didn't know what was going on in the channel. When we got to the other side, we turned north a bit and flew for a few minutes and then dropped dummy paratroopers. And they were rather interesting because they made noises and shot off fireworks and it looked like they were really something going on. We went, uh, Did you know at the time that you took off that it was the big landing? Mm -hmm. Yes, we knew. We knew, yeah. They, uh, we had, well, we had been briefed to go the night before and of course it was scrubbed. So, so you, you were involved in the ghost fleet then, really? 
the, the window you were dropping was the the ghost fleet? No, I I don't think it was, I don't think it was a, a ghost fleet because there was so much of it going down that that I thought I my I thought the primary reason was that they couldn't see anything in the channel, not just. Uh, screening for for anything, you know. they couldn't see anything that was going on, and uh, but there was no. They didn't have any simulated ghost fleet that I could see down there. I could see the deck pretty well. On D Day, you were carrying paratroopers, were you? No, dummy. Dummies. Dummy paratroopers, little guys about this yeah. high. Yeah, and then when you let them go down, if they got lights on them or anything, they looked like the real thing. They were firing off stuff and dropping down. And so came back out. Another night we went we went down into France, uh, south of Lyon, quite quite deep, and uh, we couldn't get back out at daylight in the nighttime before daylight. So we went across the Mediterranean, eating chicken sandwiches, and drinking <laughs> nice hot coffee. And uh, because that belonged to the two guys we dropped out, they didn't need it, <laughs> so we had theirs. And uh, landed in Algeria at a place called Belita. Stayed there overnight. we reloaded the next day, and uh, took off and went and dropped another load to the resistance uh, on the Spanish-French border up near the Pyrenees. And then back to England. Uh, How did you like the Halifax? I liked the Halifax. That was very good. I, thought it was, I think it was a little more rugged than the Lank, but I'm not too sure. They always said the Lank would break at the back door, but I don't know. <laughs> Everybody had their theory. Whichever got you home safely. Anything that got you home safely. Tiger moth, you name it. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. When you would go on these drops, would there be several aircraft, or would you be the only one? No, you you were alone most of the time. The odd time, you'd get maybe two or three on one drop, but then you never saw them. You 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 plotted your own course to what you wanted. You know, you you went where you wanted to go to get to where you were going, which was very suitable for me because I was sort of. That kind. And then Did you have uh, radar beacons to home in on when, for any of these drops? They had Rebecca uh, at some of them, but not very often, and it wasn't too effective. I think maybe we only used it maybe four or five times. I guess if, I don't know how big the Rebecca was, or was it heavy to lug around, but they didn't seem to have it that often. So it didn't work unless you had the beacon set up ahead of time. Yeah, well, this is the point, you know. They, and they didn't want to spend too much time in the drop area because we have seen uh, vehicles coming up the roads with their lights on at times and we've been close to dropping. So you knew that somebody else was moving around with lights and you knew if they had lights that they weren't friendly. <laughs>